The following program was produced by the students of the Brian Lamb School of Communication at Purdue University. On this edition of Fast Track, we travel to Fort Wiatnon and learn more about history 300 years in the making. I don't expect them to learn about the French and any war and who fought who and what battle and everything else, but they should at least know that this means lock, stock, and barrel, not whatever they're thinking it means. We take you to the edge of campus at Cafe Literato, where you'll find students, families, and police officers dining at this recent Purdue staple. There's been several times I come in off duty with my family too, so. We'll show you more about the recently announced facility for Purdue Energy Research. And learn more about the breakfast club that doesn't involve the bars. Fast Track starts now. Welcome back to another edition of Fast Track. I'm Ashton Adi. And I'm Danielle DiCapua. First up, a trip back to the past. It's the 50th anniversary of the Feast of the Hunter's Moon Festival in Tippecanoe County. A recreation of the annual fall gathering of the French and Native Americans, which took place back in the 1700s. Our Brad Pushgar went to Fort Wiatnon for the weekend celebration and a step back in time. Last weekend gave West Lafayette a gateway into the past. Feast of the Hunter's Moon celebrated its 50th anniversary at Fort Wiatnon, which was celebrating its 300th anniversary. Offering games, food, and informational tents, the festival brings together all kinds of people. While a lot of fun and games, Feast of the Hunter's Moon also gives those coming out the chance to learn about a lot of great history. While some are coming to the festival for the first time, others have been around for years. They were specific kings and queens. Uh, what I have here is the king called Charlemagne. Uh, Charlemagne is one of the kings. David, Caesar, and Alexander are the other kings. Meet Ray Raywold. He knows a lot about cards. This is the cards we basically play today, but I was directly copied from the French, early French deck. And even more about guns. The very first gun I made, uh, which is back in my other camp, uh, probably took me about 240 hours to make. Ray has done historical reenactments for nearly 40 years. What surprised him the most through these years are two contrasting things. I'm sometimes extremely surprised at what people know. And then sometimes I'm extremely surprised how little they know. You know, some people are given good bases for learning specific history, but others aren't. There's some simple things he wants those that come by his tent to know, though. But everybody should know that a musket was a lock, stock, and barrel. It's the lock, the stock, and the barrel. That's what I tell people. I don't expect them to learn about the French and any war and who fought who and what battle and everything else, but they should at least know that this means lock, stock, and barrel, not whatever they're thinking it means. He does this all just to bring a spark of curiosity about history into more people. I like to uh, get just that little spark started uh, for people to maybe, you know, do look at word origins and see where word or, or words come from. That spark has started for Max and Lucy Reinhardt. Their favorite part of the festival isn't the food and games, but rather... Just going back in time. Mm -hmm. And remembering all the stuff that we have been doing here. Kids and adults having a good time and learning more about history in the process. People are enjoying themselves here. You know, whether they're drinking root beer or eating a um, buffalo burger and. You know, and believe it or not, they are learning whether they realize they're learning or not. For Fast Track, I'm Brad Pushkar. Back here on campus, Purdue has always been known for its astronauts and engineers. But in the future, it may also be known for making leaders in the brewing industry. Beer has become a big business, and I met some people here at Purdue who are all part of it. Sophomore Mary Claire Palchinski takes pride in explaining her major. 
So when I go home over the break, I have to explain to all my aunts and uncles that I'm getting a food science major. They don't really know what I'm going to do with that. And so when I tell them, like, I'll be making alcohol when I graduate, they really don't think I'm doing something productive. But it's course plan. It's a top-renowned program. Palchinski is also proud to tell others about the program's newest accomplishment. Boiler Gold. Uh, it's a delicious session beer. Dr. Brian Farkas is the head of the food science program at Purdue that recently teamed up with People's Brewery to create the Boiler Gold American Golden Ale. A product that I think people will really enjoy with football, basketball, and parties, things like that, um, that is not overly hoppy, overly malty, overly um, obtrusive in any way. Selling out so quickly and doing so well is just showing that like it's such a strong um, focus and such a strong thing for Purdue to start getting into because there's a very good demand for it. And if there's a demand, why not meet it? Along with Boiler Gold being a success, the proceeds from its sales go back to the university. Alumni and Purdue supporters can feel good that they are supporting ultimately agriculture and agricultural research um, at Purdue University. And with that research, the food science program is now able to offer fermentation as a minor. Ultimately, we are here to produce graduates that stay in Indiana and grow our economy, and that's what this is about. Legally, I'm not 21 years old yet, but I do plan on minoring in fermentation. Now, Palchinski can take pride in another part of her studies. It makes class a little, uh, little more enjoyable when you can go and you're strictly talking about beer for the day or cheese or other fermentation-based products. Right now, Boiler Gold is only being sold at the 1869 Tap Room as well as Purdue Sporting Events. Two Purdue professors are developing a creative and fun method to improve the symptoms for patients of an otherwise serious disease. Fast Check's Riley Christian shows us how they're using a gaming system to help patients battling Parkinson's. Researchers Jeff Haddad and Jessica Huber are using the Nintendo Wii gaming system in a pretty interesting way at Purdue University. So we're um, developing a technique for Parkinson's patients to improve their balance and cognition. The two have teamed up to study how to improve balance and memory for Parkinson's patients. A patient with Parkinson's disease has a motor a de a degenerative disease, so that means it's getting worse over time. And the disease can affect several domains. Patients with Parkinson's typically develop a tremor in their hands and a stooped posture while walking. As far as gait and balance is concerned, they have a hard time sometimes with walking. They'll take small steps. This, they won't lift their feet as much when they walk. In addition to motor skills, Parkinson's also affects an individual's ability to balance. There's a reflex in our body that rights us. If we lean one way or another, we automatically right. Um, and that reflex is impaired as Parkinson's disease progresses. And so all of these things make them less stable. On top of that, they have some cognitive change that makes it harder to do everyday tasks, which are generally multi-component. The duo at Purdue is using motion sensing platforms like the Nintendo Wii to study and improve these symptoms in Parkinson's patients. So the idea is they, you, we use repurposed gaming technology where they have to stand on either a Wii board or we're also using a Microsoft Connect, some kind of peripheral that will measure their body movements. Um, and while they are interfacing with this repurposed gaming technology, they're facing a computer screen. And on that computer screen, there's a cursor that represents how their body's moving. Students at Purdue have helped develop three different games that Jeff and Jessica have used in junction with the motion sensing boards to improve the symptoms of Parkinson's. Essentially what these games are supposed to do is challenge different, different aspects of executive function and, and specifically the aspects of executive function that are known to decrease with Parkinson's disease. The simulations help improve motor skills and cognitive abilities simultaneously. So kind of what we've tried to do is kind of put those two together with the, with the idea that most of the things we do aren't just motor, aren't just cognitive, but people do these things simultaneously. And most of the skills you do in your daily life involve both of those. Eventually, Jeff and Jessica hope the program can be used as year-round physical therapy. They have a limited number of sessions that they can see a physical therapist for, and often 
their disease will decline across the whole year, but they'll only have this small chunk of physical therapy. So the idea is to extend treatment over their entire year. And so far, they have seen promising preliminary success in the program. And we've seen that there are aspects of communication that improve. That's kind of my area. And it, it, we did find that people stabilize themselves more when doing things with their hands, precision things with their hands after training. So the outcomes of the therapy are directly in line with improvements on some of the basic things that we see impact stability in Parkinson's disease. Still head on fast track. Students have heard of the tradition of breakfast club, but there's a new club on campus that takes a different spin on that. A completely different spin. We'll show you. In another edition of Purdue Eats, this time we head off campus and up the road for a look at brick oven pizza and a whole lot more, including coffee. We'll take you behind the counter at Cafe Literato. I think everyone should consider the three-year degree program. It's a completely viable option if you want to work hard and get it done. The thing I liked best was the ability to start law school right away. It's really a great way to save some money. College is really expensive and it's super necessary, so if you can cut it down, I think it's great. It was an awesome, valuable experience to get done in three years and then start the next part of my life. Welcome back. Before the break, we told you about a festival that happened off campus, but on Saturday, a festival was bringing together students on campus. Our Brad Pushkar went out to Starry Night to find out more about what the festival is all about. Starry Night Festival filled Chauncey Square Saturday night. The sound of music and guests crowded the downtown area. Students all came out for the unofficial kickoff to fall for a fun night out with friends. I enjoy the hangout with my friends and seeing all the energy and all the people. Okay. Uh, my favorite part is I love the atmosphere, I love the cold weather, the fact that people can just come out, have a good time, de stress from school and everything. Like, that's the greatest thing. With two stages, Music lovers weren't disappointed. Not only the Starry Night have great music playing, but vendors lining the street for students to shop at. Many of these vendors are small businesses or nonprofits helping those in need. Grain of Rice Project was just one of those nonprofits with their mission helping Kenyan people. They work with 16 Kenyan artisans to bring their designs and creations to America. Each artist has kind of their own line of product here, their own specialty. It's just a stepping stone for these artists, hoping to help move them on in life. And the idea is not to keep them in our program, but really to give them hope uh, and give them the skill that, where they can eventually go on, uh, go on and, and move on to bigger and better things. Todd Handlickton is one of the small business owners at Starry Night. His shop, Brainchild Conspiracy, has a simple idea behind its creations. Find stuff that vintage that I think is beautiful and just redo it into something that's useful for today. He takes wood golf clubs and turns them into bottle openers, old sheets into pillows, sticks into decorative key rings, so they can go in the dishwasher and, go and old glass bottles into drinking glasses. We've become a disposable society, and I really would rather get away from that. Uh, reuse stuff, try to buy second hand. You don't need to buy everything new. Um, and support local artists. He's found Starry Night a great success and loves everything about the event. Every year the students are amazing. Uh, the helpers are amazing. They help us load in, they help us load out. It's one of the better run shows that I do every year. Reporting for Fast Track, I'm Brad Pushkar. Even if you miss the festival, many of the vendors have websites that you can order from all year round. Have you ever headed off campus to meet a friend for a meal at Cafe Literato? Well, on this edition of Purdue Eats, I went to the West Lafayette restaurant that does its part to feed and help the local community. So we are here at Cafe Literato. I'm with Craig. What are we going to make today? Um, I think we're going to start with the Mediterranean pizza, one of our favorites. All right, what's in that? Uh, we have a pesto mixed with a pizza sauce, uh, Italian sausage, sun-dried tomatoes, black olives, balsamic onions, and feta cheese. A lot of stuff in there, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lot. All right, let's get to it. All right. 
So we'll start with our dough that we just press. Did you make the dough minutes. yourself? Uh, yeah, so we make our dough uh, in the back of the house and then um, it's portioned out prior to uh, service. So. so we'll start with a mix of a marinara and pesto. And then a little bit of mozzarella. Some sun-dried tomatoes. Italian sausage. Black olives. A few balsamic onions. And we'll top it off with some feta cheese. And then we toss that in the oven for about six or seven minutes. Mediterranean pizza. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Have a good Appreciate day. Yep. Yeah. How long have you been here? We're going on four years this October. So why did your owners choose the name Cafe Literato? Um, it comes from the Latin word for literature. It kind of is based off that, um, and so that's how we came up with that. We like the idea for people to come and kind of hang out and be able to study and read the paper and get a cup of coffee, um, and being so close to Purdue and having all those students there as well. What makes Cafe Literato different from any other cafe? The Italian kind of inspired ingredients, fresh ingredients, um, everything's basically made in house. Um, to have that and also the presence I think we bring to the community and um, getting away from a lot of the chains that are in the, uh, in the area and just having something different to offer folks. And this restaurant is serving more than dishes, they're also serving up smiles. A big part of our business is regulars and um, I see people in here sometimes for breakfast and lunch, um, a lot of police officers and uh, firemen and such are in here multiple, multiple times a week so um, it's nice to see continual faces and, uh, and it, you know, it feels good, it makes you think that you're doing a good job when people you know, keep coming back. So what does Cafe Literato do to help the community? So we uh, offer um, major discounts to police and firemen, um, donate a lot of uh, products such as food and um, money and gift cards and stuff to uh, various charities and events in the community. We don't ask for it, they just automatically give it to us, but yeah. And there's, there's been several times I come in off duty with my family too, so. No, it's just because I, I love the food. <laughs> Building relationships um, with customers is, is a big reason about why I love what I do and why I'm here every day and why I'm staying. You're going to get taken care of. Literato rocks, so yes. get a chance to eat here. It'll be worth your while. To see for yourself if Cafe Literato truly does rock, you can visit it every day until 9 p.m. at 1920 Northwestern Avenue in West Lafayette. Still ahead, a look ahead at Purdue men's and women's basketball, a preview of this season and why they feel like offseason has helped them put a step ahead of their competitors in the Big Ten. We'll be right back. One of the things that I really enjoy about being a professor at Purdue and being able to interact with students is that oftentimes I get emails from students several years on after they've graduated saying like, your course changed the way that I look at sport. Your course changed the way that I think about our society.
My research focuses on the amount of coverage and the type of coverage of men's and women's sports on televised news and sports highlight shows. What kinds of stories are the media telling about sports and then how does that inform and impact the way we think about gender and race? My freshman year, everything was about boys football and boys basketball. We didn't have the language or the ability to articulate or to know better that if we were supporting the boys team, we should have been supporting the girls team as well. So I was really interested in kind of learning more about the cultural aspects of why some of those gender differences might exist. The problem that I'm trying to solve is how do we address the larger inequalities within sport that relate specifically to sociocultural factors. For me, that's important. It's just exposing students to a different way of thinking about and seeing their world. Next weekend start off the first practices of the 2017-2018 season for both Purdue basketball teams, where they're starting to get a feel for where they need to improve before the first games. The men's team had their first official practice of the season, but it's actually their 30th so far. Having practiced through July and August for the World University Games in Taipei, where the team ended up placing second, many of the players have more experience than they would have at this point in the season. The players and coaches agree that the extra time they gain from the University Games will help put the defending Big Ten champs a step ahead of the competition. Uh, you can definitely tell we came out from, you know, seeing from previous and where we are this year, we're definitely a step ahead on the curve. You know, Coach Penn was, you know, willing to let us, you know, correct our mistakes more than, you know, coach it a lot. So, of course, he, he went out on some pointers and showed us, you know, what we needed to do. But other than that, it was mostly on our own and mostly correcting our own mistakes. I think we have older players, experienced players, and then this experience of playing in Taiwan and the World University Games really helped us. Um, it also showed us, I think, how successful we can be together and how good of an offensive team we can be. The women's basketball team started off its season on Sunday with its first official practice of the year. Fans came out to see their Boilers start off the season in Mackey Arena. Old and new faces on the court, including sophomore Tiara Murphy, who's returning after an ACL tear, stopped her season early last year. Freshman Carissa McLaughlin also showing she's ready to take the plunge into Big Ten basketball. The Indiana Miss basketball winner is the ninth to attend Purdue, with head coach Sharon Versa being the first. Standing out to coaches, though, is lone senior Adriana Keyes, who's been preparing to lead her team to another successful season. This is my team and I'm ready to lead us. Um, we've got some great talent, um, so once we can put it all together, we'll be a great team. I think right now it's keys. I think um, that has to be earned. And I think it may be, you know, we'll see. It might be into the, you know, the juniors can help out. You know, I think Abby does a fantastic job bringing people together and doing on and off the court stuff. Um, but, you know, we've got to have some young kids that are sophomores that step up a little bit. But keys is, keys is the right kid and she's the one that can really help us. The men's team will have their first game against Southern Illinois University Edwardsville on November 10th in Mackey Arena, and the women will start on the same day at Central Michigan. Still to come here on Fast Track, a big announcement about Purdue's role in energy research. The potential worldwide impact it could make when we come back. Being involved in the three-year program at Purdue made it easier to say to myself I could get done in three years. The three-year program helped save me a ton of money. In not completing my fourth year, I would save around $30,000. It will give you an advantage, if anything. Doing the three-year program at Purdue has shown me that I have motivation to do whatever it takes to get my degree. If you're a student who would like to save thousands of dollars and also show the world that you're a real go-getter, here's a way to do it. I hope every graduate of our College of Liberal Arts shares my intense pride in the college for its new innovation, the Degree in Three program. Special congratulations to all those enterprising the liberal arts students who want to come get a first-rate liberal arts education and do it on a faster track. The National Science Foundation has chosen Purdue to lead a new cutting-edge research facility. Emma Carpenter explains exactly how this facility will impact the years to come. Purdue Engineering continues to climb the ladder of innovation. 
the National Science Foundation has officially chosen Purdue to lead an engineering research center that could have an enormous impact on the U.S. economy. We are proud that Purdue is the lead institution of a new ERC, CSTAR, the Center for Innovative and Strategic Transformation of Alchemy Resources. CSTAR can be found in Purdue's Discovery Park and will be led by Fabio Ribeiro, the Arne Norris and Eleanor Shreve Professor of Chemical Engineering. Instead of importing oil from all over the world, Ribeiro and his team are hoping to take the abundant supply of shale resources already existing in the United States and use it as a bridge fuel until renewables can support our needs. We reaffirm our commitment to propel Purdue engineering to the pinnacle of research excellence. This new technology brought to you by Purdue Research will help the United States not only maintain the manufacturing competitiveness, but will also help reduce the environmental hazards associated with liquid gas transportation. Ribeiro and his team believe that there is an enormous potential just waiting for someone to take advantage of it. In fact, it is believed that this project could inject $20 billion annually into the U.S. economy. I'm Emma Carpenter, reporting for Fast Track News. Operations began October 1st, and the team is holding an optimistic outlook for the future of energy efficiency. Finally, this week, a look at some interesting traditions on campus. Early each Saturday morning football game day here at Purdue, students rally outside the neon cactus dressed in costumes of all shapes and sizes. With cactus cups in hand, students indulge in this game day tradition. But what students don't realize is that this is not the only breakfast club here on campus. Taylor Dejka has more about a student-run organization known as the Real Breakfast Club. On this quaint Tuesday morning, students meet at Circle Pines Cooperative for another RBC, or the Royal Breakfast Club, meeting. The student-run organization started from students inspired by the movie Fargo. Marge and Norm Gunderson, husband and wife in the film, gather in a scene to eat breakfast in their pajamas. Alex Toller, vice president and co-founder, expressed how he came to the idea of RBC. Kind of brought us back home, so we were like, let's, let's start that here, so we did. The whole idea behind the Real Breakfast Club, or RBC, is the future for club members. RBC Club Caston Everidge is the president this year. Um, for me, anyways, is training for retirement. Um, a lot of things that I do, I'm not going to be able to do when I'm older. I like to play basketball and like go fast and stuff. So someday there might be a day when I can't do those things. This simple club gives students here on campus a chance to reconnect with their adult selves as they are one step closer into the real world. It could be sitting around with a couple of my friends and drinking coffee and watching really bad local news. And uh, when that day comes, I want to be ready, and that's why. The main goal of this student-run organization is to unite students in another way than before a game. Another level of commitment to get out of bed at 6 a.m. and go out of your way, sometimes even drive a few miles, to come and sit in here and drink coffee and watch the local news. So next time you hear Breakfast Club on Purdue campus, consider Tuesday morning as another day to gather with friends early in the morning. Trade in your cactus cups for coffee mugs and take a seat on the couch because the local news is waiting for you and your friends. That's all the time we have for this week's edition of Fast Track. I'm Danielle DiCapua. And I'm Ashton Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.